blue light is not just problematic for sleep, it's also problematic for insulin and blood sugar levels. This can lead to depression, cancer, obesity, diabetes. There's numerous studies, probably about 40 years worth of them. I was thinking to myself, it's like every condition could be helped with this, you know, sleep, hormones, energy, etc. These principles that we'll talk about, I'll just loosely call them, you know, quantum health or circadian health. Uh, as you pointed out, once you start to drill into that, there's a lot of different rabbit holes to go down. But these principles are very natural based. In a lot of cases, they're more easy and accessible to people, uh, especially when compared to what conventional medicine does or even functional medicine does. And so they're very accessible topics. And because of that, it's, it's exciting because it gives people a lot more power over their health than they realize they have. And then they, in many cases that they've been led to believe they have in doctor's offices or other providers' offices. So can you just st start by telling us how you really got excited about these ideas and what is some of the impact that you've seen them have for people? So anyone listening, if they're maybe a little familiar with this, but don't know it as well as your audience might, so they can start to get an idea of what's possible for them if they listen to what you have to say and learn about these principles and take away some easy ways to apply them in their life, which we're going to give them in this episode. Okay, great. I think a lot of things are about solving problems. And I'd say lots of people have problems with sleep um, and then with um, stuff like hormone imbalances, um, anxiety, depression, um, not being able to lose weight, a, a big issue. And when we look through a biochemistry lens, we can, because I was a biochemist for a long time, there's limitations. And wh wh when I ask people to look around, they can clearly see that the current model, as in allopathic medicine and using supplements, isn't working because there's more supplements than ever available and people seem to be even sicker than they used to be. So the biochemistry paradigm, there's obviously something not quite right there. I'm not saying that there isn't anything wrong, there's stuff wrong with supplements. I'm, I moved away from that just um, because I found that things like light, for example, people don't really realize how important light is because they think it's just something that makes the room bright, but they don't realize there's all these different colors of light and there's invisible light, which would be things like non-native EMF. And then that the light that comes out of the bulb is wildly different from the light that's produced by the sun. And just talking about the sun in general, unless you start to get into it, you don't even consider what the sun actually is and, and what it actually produces, because it produces other things other than um, light, which can be very beneficial for people. We may touch on it later. But, but I think also when it comes to, say, we'll start maybe with something like sleep, which is a big problem. People are unaware that just something as simple as wearing blue blocking glasses like I'm wearing now uh, and turning the, dimming the lights down at night, maybe changing them to incandescent bulbs or a red light and making their bedroom pitch black can be a very simple way to improve the health. Because in simple terms, like a decentralized system, we've got dark and light if we start really, really basic. So it needs to be dark when we want to sleep and while they're getting ready to sleep. And it needs to be nice and bright when we're out and about in the day. And a lot of people, that's the complete, complete opposite, that, it, that their bedrooms, they've got thin curtains and th there's an epidemic of blue light pollution now from other people's lights outside. People are on um, their computers or watching Netflix or on their phones and t uh, while they're in bed. So the, that darkness aspect's been taken away. And then when it comes to light, people are unaware that the morning light that they receive and seeing the sunrise will set them up for having a good night's sleep. So we could just start there with um, just talking about light versus dark. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. I mean, as you, you set it up there, it just, I was thinking to myself, it's like every condition could be helped with this, you know, sleep, hormones, um, energy, et cetera, which, which then filters down to any you know, chronic health issues or anything people struggle with. And I think it's so easy to hear something like that because I did this many times in the past. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, light and dark, that's like a good idea. But then we just go 
go on, continue living our lives the way we are, which to your point in the modern world, especially with screens, TVs, computers, and smartphones, we do get a, a lot of the inversion of the natural light where it's bright at night and it's really sending these signals to our body. So yeah, let's absolutely start there. Someone hears that and, and does what I used to do. Like, yeah, the light would be a good idea. Why is it much more than that? Why is it so beneficial to, to get this more dialed in? Okay, so we can just sort of simplify it. So we can say that when we're exposed to blue light and bright light, it stimulates cortisol because that's kind of our waking up hormone. And a lot of people, I'm sure, have told you that they've got too much cortisol and they're worried about their stress and cortisol belly and things like that. And then if we flip it over to the other side, melatonin isn't necessarily the hormone of darkness, but it's something that the pineal gland makes at night so that we can go to sleep and also stay asleep. And I think um, if we sort of invert these, say if we've got too much light before bed, or in the evening, then we're going to have a deficit of melatonin, which means not just bad sleep, but also it's going to inhibit healing, detox, um, the, the modulation of other sex hormones. Um, and also m melatonin has a role over body weight as well. And there are numerous studies about bad sleep, sleeping with the light on in your bedroom, working night shifts and uh, this can lead to depression, cancer, obesity, diabetes. There's numerous studies, probably about 40 years worth of them. Uh, and then we can think, okay, if we expose ourselves to lots of blue light when it's meant to be dark, say going to the mall at, um, at 10 o'clock, uh, then we've pumped ourselves full of blue light, which is not only going to tank our melatonin, but now we're pushing cortisol up too early. Um, well, it's like in, in the evening. So we've got sort of a stress issue because a lot of people have anxiety. So it's not just not being able to get to sleep, they feel stressed out as well. So just by considering those two hormones, um, we can see how light in the evening could be problematic. And if we flip it over to the converse, so we can think about morning light. So first of all, there are studies where it's, I can't remember exactly the full details, but one group was... Um, obese women and they found if they got between 45 and 90 minutes of um, light in the morning, their BMIs dropped by 1.5 and that's quite big. And I think the study was, I can't remember how many weeks it was over, but it wasn't a long, a long study. So that's quite sort of significant. Um, and then there was another study about morning light and, thing, and blood sugar regulation. So there's something to getting the morning light. Um, but before the sort of morning light, because most people will tell me, oh, yes, I go out for a walk in the morning with my dog. But then I don't know what they did for sunrise, because at sunrise, there's a special blend of red and blue light. Uh, so it first of all switches on our sort of hormone cascade for the day correctly. It, it warms up something in, in the mitochondria called the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle. It's like a wheel that pushes electrons and protons into the mitochondria. So this is, would be really important for sort of metabolism and correct use of fat. But also the other important thing about the sunrise is that our body clocks drift throughout the day um, and then they need resetting every, every sunrise. Like when your phone stops working properly, the best thing to do is turn it off and on again and magically everything settles back down. So there's a, a really important reason for seeing the sunrise because the mixture of light you get there isn't the same as sunset. Even though it looks the same to us, according to our biology, it can tell the difference between a sunrise and a sunset. So sunrise would be getting ready for the day gradually, and then the sunset is a signal to start to wind things back down. So um, the other important thing about sunrise is with that, it's very gentle light. So it's very, very healing for people who've got skin problems or eye problems. And that would be the place to start before buying red light panels and things, just because you don't have to spend any money. And the sun's provided you with a perfect blend of different color light. And I was actually reading a study yesterday that violet light, which would appear also at sunrise, um, can be really helpful for myopia. So um, there's numerous benefits to the eyes because obviously our eyes, I think, are really important because obviously um, all of quantum biology begins in the eye and there's an epidemic of people wearing eyeglasses really early or young people or children with myopia. 
So there's the plethora of benefits of just the sunrise alone, but there are more complicated things um, to do with what happens at sunrise as well. Maybe that'll be for another podcast. But for people who are into meditation and spiritual practices, um, the way there's something called four wave uh, mixing that happens. So it makes whatever they want to do in a spiritual sense, it's more powerful at sunrise or sunset, especially if they're outside and the double bonus if they're on a ley line or a magnetic crossover line. But, but if we think about when our ancestors would have done their sort of um, religious practices, there's lots of things that I found that happen or occur at sunrise. For example, the sun salutation in, um, in yoga. And when my father went to India, he said that they used to climb up the mountain every day and wait for the sun and they all clapped when it came up and then they went back down again. So, so there's a lot to be said about um, what our ancestors would have done. And then if we think about before um, we had this life that we did, the light signals alone would have been what triggered um, our ancestors to get up because they didn't have any other kind of signal. So it's very much hardwired into sort of a, lo a long time of our evolution um, to be able to see the sunrise. There's obviously important um, biochemical reactions that happen. But then again, looping back to another big problem that people have, which is obesity, there's a big link between sort of leptin resistance and people ha struggling with their, their weight. And the very first step with sort of leptin resistance and thyroid issues would be seeing the sunrise um, and then seeing the next step stage, which is the UV rise. So about an hour after sunrise, the ultraviolet A light comes out. And this is important for making dopamine, um, serotonin. It regulates thyroid, it regulates endocannabinoids. So we've got a second stage in the morning that basically makes um, or encourages our body to make neurotransmitters. And I would just say that's getting high on your own supply. Um, and then again, blue light is not just problematic for sleep. It's also problematic for insulin and blood sugar levels and also um, for leptin. So very basically, if somebody's never heard of anything to do with quantum biology before, seeing the sunrise, getting morning light, and blocking blue light um, in the evening and turning the lights down um, would be a, a big step in improving leptin signaling and also uh, improving metabolism. And it's not complicated to do. It sounds so ridiculously easy. How can this possibly work? But then when it comes to looking in the literature, like I mentioned, there's uh, like several studies about morning light and metabolism. And then there's a whole plethora of studies about blue light and obesity. So it would just make sense for somebody to consider that because for, for people who are skeptical, they can always look it up as well. Um, but it's so simple to do that. And also it's what our ancestors would have done. And again, our mitochondria, which uh, don't just make energy for us, they do a lot more. They make, make water and they signal. They're programmed by sunlight as well. So seeing more of the sun and less of the inside of your house and your artificial lights and your Wi-Fi and your and your Bluetooth is obviously going to be beneficial on multiple levels. Can you talk about, you mentioned the body clocks, and I think you're referencing a lot of the, some of the impacts to the body clocks as you're talking here, but can you explain what the body clock is or are? And you said quantum biology starts in the eye. Why does quantum biology start in the eye? Okay, so if we think of the master clock, the SCN, the suprachiasmic nucleus, that's behind the eye. So we can think of it as the big clock. And then the, once this receives light, it oscillates the signal down to other clocks in the body. So we can think that the liver's got a clock, the gut's got a clock, the heart's got a clock, the kidney's got a clock. And, cons and to put it into context, we obviously want our bowels to move at particular times of the day, not at 3 a.m. No, no, uh, if, if your circadian rhythm's in sync, you should do um, a morning poo about the, after you've seen some of the, sun, the, the sunlight. That's a sign things are, are, are going in the right way. So if we've, we've thought about the big clock in the eye, then the medium clocks in the organs. And then if we uh, go down a little bit more, we can think about cell clocks. So the cells all need to know um, when they should be detoxing or killing themselves or making hormones. And then if we go deeper again, there's a clock in front of all of our genes. 
So we would want gene expression to happen. So with gene expression, it's something like turning lights and appliances on. If we expressed all of our genes all at once, it would be like turning every single appliance and every single light on in the house and nobody would ever do that. We just turn on and off what we need. Um, So when it comes to all of this being in sync with itself, the the more in time your clocks are, because now we know that there's lots of them, um, the better your health span and the better your lifespan. And just for people to sort of imagine how would it feel to have a body clock that's out of line. If you can think about jet lag, um, where some people get binge eat uh, when they're traveling, some people get depression, some people can't sleep, some people all of a sudden the pain comes back. Other people just get really confused. Other people get brain fog. So we can think of a circadian rhythm that's out of sync, a bit like an airport Um, where it's not quite running smoothly. And you can imagine the chaos of aeroplanes not taking off on time, angry customers, uh, suitcases getting lost and things like that. So we can think about our timing in the body like this. And then from a physics perspective, um, inflammation is referred to as chaos or lack of coherence. So if everything in the body is not quite in time with itself, it sort of creates chaos and lack of... um, lack of sort of lack of coherence but then if we then look back through what the, pa- the the studies say on a biochemical level all of the diseases associated with um, circadian disruption could also be attributed to inflammation so a bad body clock will leak can or will lead to inflammation but it would be called chaos but it's fundamentally the, the same thing um just it, it If you're a biochemist, you'll talk about it in a particular way. If you're a biophysicist, you'll refer to it as as chaos. Um, Was that um, satisfactory as the description for how a body clock works? That was. That was fantastic. I I love a couple of the analogies you used. The the coherence versus chaos one is just, is really great. Like, you know, you can hear this with like tuning forks or if anyone plays the the glasses or crystal where when, when the sound gets coherent, it sounds clean, crisp, and, and beautiful and organized versus chaos would be, you know, all these different inharmonious um, notes playing all at the same time. And it just sounds like a jumbled mess. And then if I take that and imagine that going on, imagine that going on in your body, right? With all the, the cells and all the processes that are taking place, it, it makes perfect sense why inflammation would get created probably pretty quickly if there's enough chaos going on. And the jet lag analogy is another example that, you know, everyone who's traveled uh, more than a few time zones probably knows what that's like. You just Mm -hmm. don't feel your best. You feel off, feel tired, maybe cranky, like you said, hungry, maybe binging. And so I think it's a great analogy because at home, this stuff on a day-to-day basis could be a little more subtle, but the jet lag analogy makes it a little more clear. Like now this is how disturbing it can be to your body. And then just imagine if we're doing that day after day, year after year, that's how it, it can all add up. So I love that analogy because for me, it helps take some of the theory. Again, I go back to what I said earlier, like, yeah, it would be a good idea to go catch the sunrise, but now I feel like snoozing today. It takes that whole debate and puts it in a more clear picture. It's like, well, do I want to feel like I'm jet lagged every day? And a lot of people feel like that, but they're like, oh, what's going on? Oh, I'm just, I'm getting older. I guess, you know, so many people write off unnecessary symptoms as aging because that's what they're told in certain offices. That's what our society thinks. And, and that's the, the norm of our society, unfortunately, but it doesn't have to be that way, which is another reason these principles and this this lifestyle is is so enticing because imagine going from jet lag to feeling like a million bucks because you slept well your body repaired it's doing everything it needs to do and going back to the body clocks it essentially sounds like every part of the body has different jobs to do at different times just almost like to use another agile an analogy like a factory now imagine a giant factory with thousands of workers in the body scale, it would probably be like millions or billions, but we'll just keep it manageable. Thousands of workers, and then nobody knows when their shift is, which production line is working, when the supplies are coming in, where they're supposed to go. It would turn into a gigantic mess really quickly. And that's happening at a 
cellular and, and even smaller, more quantum level. And I think it's tricky to the average person because you you may not feel that day to day or it may creep in so gradually that from one day to the next, you don't really notice. But from one year to the next, most people really do. Oh, absolutely. And also we can attribute common problems like, say, a kidney clock that's off. Uh, pe- lots of people get up to pee in the night loads of times and then they'll blame hormones and all random things where the kidney is confused and it thinks doesn't know what time of day it is and it and it shouldn't be produ- producing uh, urine so often because it thinks it might be daytime so that's um another common thing also when it comes to common problems and body clocks the skin clock and the gut clock are linked to one another and there's an epidemic of gut issues and i encounter people that like bit by bit eliminate foods uh, to the point where they're sometimes just eating chicken and lemon and that's it because and I get I get to the point where I think and have to explain to people that's not you being sensitive because not being able to eat food challenges our fundamental um, survival it's not the food it's you and then when people start to learn how the skin clocks and the gut clocks have a relationship with one another and lack of um, exposure to sunlight on the skin and sunlight in general can wreak havoc on the gut microbiome because it's like the mitochondria it's inside and it can't see what's going on on the outside same as the mitochondria they're deep inside our cells so they result on the, so the way the light works in the body it'll um, strike the skin and then there are certain um, receptors in the skin like there's um, a melanopsin which can sense uh, blue light so that signal and there are melanopsin receptors in arteries so that's one way in which blue light signals can get from the skin into the blood and then into the rest of the body so um, and so there's an important consideration when we talk about gut issues, because if we're sitting around artificial light, because bear in mind Wi-Fi microwaves, um, EMFs as in electrical magnetic fields, they're all light that we just can't see, but it's still going to have an impact on the body because it doesn't matter whether the light can penetrate or not. It, it can activate um, certain uh, receptors on the skin, and then that signal gets propagated through the body by something called nonlinear optics. Because inside our body, we've got a whole plethora of different molecules that can pass light from on from each other, like vitamin D, cholesterol, um, all sorts of molecules that can pass light um, from the surface of the body all the way down into the mitochondria because there are vitamin D receptors in the mitochondria and then vitamin D is made from UVB light. So it's a way to be able to get the UV signal all the way inside of the body. So when it comes to considering light and, and common problems like gut issues, it's a very important route that people can take because it's something they have not tried before. And also skin problems are very common as well be it acne, um, because blue light's going to wreak havoc with acne because it's going to push blood sugar and cortisol up. Um, and it's also going to affect uh, and damage the retinol, the vitamin A in the body. And we know that we need vitamin A is important for skin. That's why some of the acne treatments are sort of retinol based. And then things like eczema, they can be a deficiency of, and psoriasis can be a deficiency of UVA and UVB light. So, um, Again, there's links from different kinds of colored light um, into common problems that, that people encounter that they've never considered before. And then yeah, there's obviously and- the aspect of um, water, which, so, so say grounding, being outside in nature and healing biofields and plasma fields, um, that's really important for building our internal crystalline structure water, the fourth phase. And this can be really important for things like um, histamine reactions, um, skin problems, all sorts. So we haven't even touched on water because we probably won't have time. But I think sometimes just grasping the concept of one aspect of quantum biology like the light um, can open people's minds or imagination or interest to to seek um, further information on other things like magnetism and water and how that might impact them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we'll have to cover that in future episodes probably. But even even what you're saying about light, like that may be news to some people. I'm, I'm sure it is because you look at the standard advice, conventional healthcare tells people to avoid the sun. So then you're talking about you know, eczema or other skin issues potentially improving. So why is it important that light gets 
into the body and what happens there. Because I think the, the um, part you explained earlier, like, okay, it comes through the eyes, it hits sort of this master clock, which then filters down through the organs and cells in different parts of the body. I think that people, it's a little easier connection to make based on our conventional common understanding of light. But the idea of the light penetrating deeper in the body where the, the eyes, you know, don't see it. How, why is that important and how is it used in the body? Yeah. So just to loop back. So obviously the eye is the main signaler, but then remember the skin also has got um, a plethora of receptors on it. So ideally we want to, the signal coming to the eye to match the skin. So we, so we want to wear as little clothes as possible where appropriate um, when outside. Um, and then again, when it gets colder, we, we may have time to talk about why cold's really important. But then uh, on, a, on another level, uh, we'll just consider th- the sunlight in, in the sun. So in the sun, um, 50, about 50% of the light is infrared and that's available all the time because the moonlight um, is a reflection of sunlight. So we've got infrared all the time. And then the UV light, that's about 5% of the sunlight. And then the other colors um, make up uh, the rest. So we've mentioned what blue light does. So blue light from the sun um, sets our clocks and it can help with metabolism. There's actually a study on um, blue light from the sun and shrinking fat cells. But then when we talk about artificial blue light, that's not the same as the sun at all. Um, That's not full spectrum. And it doesn't have all the rest of the colors with it. It's just like a sharp peak um, around uh, about, I think, sort of like 435 to 460 nanometers. So it's a sharp peak of just blue on its own. That's the kind of blue light that pushes up insulin and pushes up blood sugar, um, steals your dopamine. So we just have to make a distinction between um, light coming out of the sun and then individual wavelengths of light. Because when we look at light, individually, we've taken it away from, from the whole spectrum, if that makes sense. Um, it's a very, a lot of people have run into horrible problems with plant medicine because they've isolated one compound out of the plant and left the 450 other compounds that are supposed to work together with that compound and then made something that creates a big issue because they, it, they weren't taking the whole package. They were trying to be clever and reductionist and take one piece. So we have to always consider that with light. So back to the infrared, um, that can penetrate really deeply into the body, probably about eight centimeters, uh, maybe. And, and red light can penetrate about two to three so that that gets past the skin because UV doesn't really penetrate. UVB can a little bit because it's got to penetrate a bit to crack the, cholest- the dihydroxy um, cholesterol to make vitamin D, um, but it doesn't get very deep. Um, but we'll consider the red light um, because you were asking, okay, the light can go in the eye and we've talked about different signals coming here. We've talked about bl- the skin can sense blue light, but it can sense other colors as well. And then the reds, they can penetrate into the body. And um, the way the mitochondria function, they've got multiple um, red light receivers inside them. And the ATPA is the, the thing that spins and makes ATP, that's um, red light active as well. So there's a big link between this infrared light and what the mitochondria need. But also um, with the work of people like Scott Zimmerman um, they uh, and others, uh, his papers and his collaborators, th- the body tends to concentrate the infrared light in amniotic fluid. So growing a new life is hugely important, but also concentrates it into cerebral spinal fluid, and obviously that's bathing our most important organ. So the, the um, idea of, um, because sometimes people get sort of confused with, with, with sunlight because we can't see near infrared or um, ultraviolet. So it looks like nature's only using the visible spectrum, but nature's much cleverer than that, that why would we waste this, the 50% of this near infrared light coming out of the sun and there are other benefits um, to red light as well. It, it's not, but also it's important to remember there isn't one wavelength superior to another. It depends on the context. Um, so when it comes to getting near infrared, like I said, um, you don't have to be naked. Uh, you don't have to be in full sunlight because when you go outside, it's going to be everywhere, including in the shade, and it'll reflect off leaves and, and the ground. 
Um, and it doesn't matter if it's cloudy because clouds block the ultraviolets anyway. So just going outside when it's cloudy, just going outside at all, it is going to bathe your body in this really healing um, near-infrared light. And then it's going to, to, to sort of concentrate it and grab it and take it to places in the body where it's needed. Um, so we, whereas when we talk about ultraviolet light, especially UVB, um, it needs to strike the skin in order to make vitamin D when you need to be in full sunlight and you need a particular intensity. So when, with the, with the, um, the near-infrared, that's pretty much safe for everybody. You can take babies out on cloudy days. P people who've got sensitive skin can go out when it's um, not so hot. So there's a huge benefit um, from just going outside in general. And it sounds really simple. And people are always asking, oh, I'll get a red light panel, which I don't have a problem with. But like I said, a red light panel can only be three, well, sorry, three or four, or even just two individual wavelengths out of the whole spectrum of the sun, which, which is something like 10 to the 36 possible wavelengths. So the red light panels are taking um, wavelengths in isolation. Yes, of course, they do something, but we don't actually fully understand. So if in doubt, because there are people who are frightened of um, devices and lights, like my mum and dad would be terrified of a red light panel, and goodness knows what they think it was. So there's a so you can get red light therapy without having to buy a panel, but then there are benefits according to the literature and from lots of anecdotal studies from the panels. But then when it comes to what you were asking about um, light getting inside the body, I would say the infrared um, is the one that that goes deep in deep inside. Whereas when we talk about the other light, they, they strike the skin or the eyes, and then. Um, the, the actual light doesn't go in. The, the signal, the the, in, the information from the light gets propagated through the body. So there's sort of two um, different ways we can think about it, that the UVs can't get in really, whereas the reds and even the blue light and the coloured light can penetrate um, a little bit. So there is, a, there is times when light goes inside and then when light um, creates a signal on the surface um, because obviously Wi-Fi and all of that can't get inside us because people say, oh, it's non-ionizing, so it can't be dangerous. Um, same with phones, but they have sort of a topological um, effect on the body, which is even more insidious because people believe them to be safe, whereas um, that's something you definitely have to be mindful of, the invisible light from the technology. Yeah, I, I really want to come back to that in a second because that's an, another concept that people are, you know, just have a tough time wrapping their mind around. But to go back to the light, so this this there's a spectrum of light, different wavelengths, and it sounds like they do different things. They give the body different instructions and our body uses it in different ways. And that, as you point out, there's all they're all important. Like nature uses isn't going to waste that. So that would be one reason why getting the sunlight that has the full spectrum. And as you mentioned earlier, it has different wavelengths at different times of the day when it's rising versus high noon versus when it's setting. So the way I think about it, and I don't know if this is right, you could tell me if you um, agree or not, but it's like a spectrum of nutrients, like one vitamin or one mineral isn't necessarily, you know, better than all the others. Like if you, if you have a total absence of one of those, you will know it. And true health is having a baseline sufficient amount of of all of them so i kind of started to think about light in a similar fashion like we need need my daily dose of of the light and that comes from the sun and when it's very segmented and highly concentrated like the blue light you explained is just a narrow band of frequency that does something in our body but usually it's it's combined with all these other frequencies from the sun and and so the body uses it in a holistic way versus when i've got my phone in front of my face and i'm staring at it it's just a concentrated amount of that one wave wavelength not to mention the fact if i'm doing that at night it's at a wavelength that would not that does not exist in nature with our um, rise and fall of the sun Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Because it's also a bit like thinking about mineral balances that for some reason people are frightened of potassium. And there's an interesting story about the FDA and that and the bad study that then scared everybody off. And then people seem to think salt's bad. And then uh, everybody thinks zinc's, but the, they need that and copper's evil, whereas it's not like that at all. Um, it's the same with light. It's about um, everything 
works as a big orchestra. I think you were talking about music and tuning forks before, and you can't just take all the trumpets out of the orchestra or have like an extra, like put 50 trumpets in the orchestra, like people who are overdosing zinc supplements or worse, vitamin D supplements. And the orchestra is going to be all distorted because you've put loads and loads and loads of one instrument in. And then um, it sounds really bizarre later. So that's the, that's also the same with the sun that, and and the spe- a full spectrum of, of light that everything comes as a package. And like you said, you can think about it as a light diet or nutrients because each wavelength or color, or, well, we'll just say a group of it um, does something different in the body. And then back to the, in, the choices or the intricacy that light could do, because I said there's 10 to the 36 possible wavelengths that come out of the sun. So that's like a piano with trillions and trillions of keys. Um, that sort of switchboard facility of light means that light inside the body, the way it can signal, and it'd be like sort of having a computer powered by light, that it'd be extremely powerful because our, each cell does something like a million um, reactions per second. And then I think, well, I don't know how many cells we've got, like trillions upon trillions. So in order to coordinate these reactions, there are so many of them um, going on. Light is the only thing that can travel fast enough. Um, Well, uh, if we're not talking about quantum entanglement, but in terms of uh, practical physics, light can travel at the speed of light. And then that's very quick. And then we've also got all these choices of these slightly different colors of light, like a switchboard or a keyboard. So, and we know how complicated, how complicated even just a simple organism is, but whereas when we get to a human, something has to be complicated and fast to be able to power us. And we also make light ourselves. This has been known for over a hundred years. Um, so not only do we receive light from the sun, um, we make our own light as well. And then, like I said before, we've got all these non-visual photoreceptors inside the body that um, can pass light around from each other. Then the mitochondria make light, the gut microbiome makes light. Um, so we can see how um, there's all this stuff going on with light in the body. And it's the thing which has the capacity and the speed and the choice, well, or the range of sort of, um, I don't put the word, the the switchboard power to to be able to control our bodies, which then comes all the way back to what you were talking about or we were talking about at the beginning, uh, how we want our body to run as smoothly and efficiently as possible. Uh, So if the light signaling in the body is all over the place on the inside or we're receiving really weird light from the outside, we can imagine how distorted um, the light show in the body would be. So it's just back to, again, what you said right at the beginning of the podcast, that people think they're getting older because they have brain fog or they ache or they're tired. And if we just break it down to sort of just simplicity of things in the body are not functioning as efficiently as they could, be it the clocks in the body are bad or the light signaling in the body's a bit off, that would... For, for a lot of people who are suffering from minor things, they'd be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's not running efficiently. So that's sort of tying up um, h- how the light could help with very common problems that we we have clients or audience that, that um, suffer from and how improving their light diet, as you said, could improve uh, the, these issues. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. As you, I know you work with clients on this. What do you see with them or do you have a couple of examples? And if, say, you're starting with someone new, what's a way that you get them started on this? Okay, with the light, I, I would just, um, I would start off with explaining about blocking blue light because sometimes people work in an office, so that's problematic. They don't control their light environment, so they would need um, daytime blue blockers. And then also just to open the window to let the natural light in because glass blocks um, the UV and the near-infrared, which we've talked about in quite a lot of depth. So, And then I would explain about, very simply, just about it has to be dark when you go in your bedroom and then about cut, about getting rid of LED lights because the LED light not only pumps out a lot of horrible blue light, the, the, the way in which the conversion from uh, AC current to DC is done electronically makes a horrible non-native EMF. So LED, not just the light that comes out, but the circuitry behind it um, makes a nasty environment. So it would be things like changing light bulbs 
um, making sure that in the evening that it's not sort of blazing bright lights like a hairdresser's studio, um, wearing blue blockers, being aware that the phone is extremely powerful um, and the light that comes out of it is very concentrated and the phone has something called flicker that annoys the brain even more. And also just on an emotional level, it's not a good idea to be um, death scrolling on TikTok at 2 a.m. or having an argument with somebody uh, um, before bed. So it would be just simple things like that. And then it would come into just basically just go out more because that's for some people, they've never heard any of this before and they get overwhelmed if they have to see the sunrise and then they've got to do the UV rise and they've got to go out half naked to get their vitamin um, D production from the UVB. But then um, I would also say that they do need to start seeing the sunrise because in certain countries, that's really easy because the light cycles are stable. But then if you're talking about something like Scandinavia or Sweden, where the sun is very unsociable. In the UK, the sun can be a bit problematic. So I would say as much as possible to see the sunrise. Then the question comes, um, what if I have to get up at 5 a.m. and the sun doesn't rise until 7? So the same uh, principles as the evening would apply, that they would block um, the artificial light, be mindful of turning on lots of lights, don't go on the phone, etc., and go about your business getting ready for work. Um, but do it being mindful that you um, want the majority of the signal in, uh, that your eyes see, the, the main signal to come from the sun. Because I know it's not practical for some people with families to see the sunrise. So that you would just do the same blue light blocking in the morning before the sun comes up as you would do in the evening. So that makes it quite easy for people because it's the same thing at either end of the day. And then when it comes to getting more sunlight, because we're hardwired, to be addicted to the sun because it doesn't just make the hormones that I was talking about. It makes melanin, it makes enkephalins and endorphins and enkephalins and endorphins are sort of um, feel-good chemicals. So people, once they get the idea, okay, this is really important, they'll actually automatically feel better so they will start going out um, in the sun more just by themselves. And like anything, Making a change for the first week can be really difficult. Same as people who start exercising or um, change their way of eating. It's hard for a week while they're adapting, but all of a sudden the benefits come and they said, oh, why didn't somebody tell me this 10 years ago? Um, because we just feel better once we get more in sync, first of all, with the sun. Um, and obviously going outside more means we get more in sync with nature. So it's just a natural coherence. Um so that's where I would start with light with people, um, just to sort of start off, like I said, with the e blocking the light in the evening and then um, seeing the sunrise. And then depending on the person, encourage them to get um, light in the daytime, especially people that can't sleep or have addictions or have dopamine problems. They really need to see that UVA light in the morning. And then again, people with obesity, it'd be the same thing as I explained before, that they um, need the sunrise to get their sort of thyroid system and energy system and, and mitochondria going in their clocks. Then they need also the UV light for all the neurotransmitters associated with sort of food cravings and things. Um, and then uh, ideally they would need the vitamin D because there's a big link between natural vitamin D we make and body weight. Um, and then for some people, I would also say, well, there's another UVA rise in the afternoon. And I've found that that can be massively helpful for people who either want to binge eat later in the day or smoke cigarettes or other things or drink alcohol. Um, that second boost of afternoon UVA um, can be really helpful um, for people as well. So it, it's about learning. Um, this is what the sun has got to offer at particular times of the day. And you need to go out um, in it um, to satisfy the biggest problem that you've got at the moment. And then you have to do it regularly. W once you start to do it regularly and your biology thinks, oh, I like this, when you stop doing it, you'll notice. Um, and that can be, so it's easier for people to start what we should be call it sun worshipping 
than doing a calorie restricted diet because obviously restricting calories is against what the body wants to do because it wants to survive and eat food so it'll fight you whereas to go out in the sun more that's what all of your biology wants so in the beginning it'll think oh dang I've got to get up I want to lie in but after a while it'll crave um, the, 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 the connection um, with the sun so in a way it's actually of all of the changes that people have to make um, falling in love with the sun is actually the easiest because it's the most natural because in lots of ways thrashing about in a gym it is it can be fun but, but it's not natural if that makes sense and sure I, I get it some people love it but lots of people it's a big ordeal whereas the, the more you um, have a relationship with the sun the easier it'll get so that's a sort of a bit of a sort of long-winded and roundabout way where I'd say to start but I've also sort of given reasons and sort of people anybody who's try to lose weight will totally understand what I meant about the calories and the fighting. Um, and then it's with the sun, I can't wait to go out in it. It's like a joy and a pleasure and, and, and a bliss. So, so I'm always hunting for um, secret ways to sneak out or extra walks. Um, and it's not like I have to make an effort. It's almost like my feet just start walking out the door. Um, so, so that's why it's um, important for people to embrace this and also to see that it's a completely normal behavior and we've got so much biochemistry because we've just scratched the surface of what the sun does um, and that it's completely normal to go out in the sun it's not dangerous it's not going to kill you it's um, not going to um, give you cancer it's um, something that's uh, an extremely important part of your existence and the more that you can associate with it uh, the better then, you, then you'll get yeah. other, uh, other clients on the complete opposite end of the spectrum that want to take their beds outside, um, <laughs> take their take their workstations outside, and it also is massively country dependent. This because in the US, because on my travels, I did spend three weeks in the US before I went to Europe, but I've been to the US lots of times, and it's a whole uh, different way of uh, managing things because you have a bug problem, um, so that that can deter people from going outside. Um, but, but what I'm saying is there are, once you know, I need to get my daily dose, my nutrients, my sun fix, there are lots of things you can do. And even just opening windows can be a start getting one of those screens in front of a porch and sitting, um, out that will, will massively help. Um, and then also if you, if you, uh, for a double bonus, um, for beginners, we're talking about now, if you could do it grounded as well. So that would be, um, standing on the earth, um, barefooted or in leather soled shoes which I think is slightly better than very expensive grounding shoes because um, there's another important thing that I didn't have time to get into before is that when we ha we've got lots, we've got electrons in our body and they basically are money and the things which pass information and energy around the body, they participate in every single reaction um, in the body pretty much is just electrons moving about. So we can just think of them um, collectively as a battery. And the more electrons we've got, the better our redox and the better health we're going to have. And grounding is one way to gather electrons. And then the other thing, the photoelectric effect, um, which Einstein talked about, that's um, where if you don't have enough electrons in your body, um, when you go out in the sun, they're, the electrons are the ones which receive the the information, the light information, and get excited. So not excited as in yay, let's party. It's sort of like a a physics term. So that's another reason why sometimes people say, well, I'm doing everything right. I'm seeing the sun. I'm seeing uh, the UV, but they're doing it from the inside of a house all the time, not actually going out, being grounded, collecting the electrons, interacting with the Schumann resonance and all the other goodies that are outside to get the full package. Um, so again, like everything, once we, people start learning about things, all of a sudden the fire hydrant opens and people feel like they're drinking, um, from a fire hydrant and all this information they'd never heard of before just kind of shoots them in the face. So, so grounding will make your light, you know, natural light interactions outside better because you're going to have more electrons. Yeah. Yeah. And I love, you know, it's not a hard sell, like to get, enjoy some more time in the sun. You know, some of the things you're mentioning, like, uh, for example, people who have binging or urges to smoke cigarettes, like if there was a pill that solved that, that thing would be a bestseller flying off the shelves. And so to know that you can get some type of that effect by stepping out, out the door, of whatever 
home or building you're in, it's it's pretty incredible. And like you've pointed out a couple of times, it's, it's so simple that our minds will tend to discount it. Like, no, that that can't really work. Really? A pill could because, and that's just this just shows you how well we've been trained that we a pill that's totally believable. Everybody would believe it. And like I said, everybody would buy it. But when it's something free, natural, available to you, wherever you are in the world, it's a t- tougher to people to, for people to wrap their minds around. So it really speaks to, you know, our modern society's understanding of nature, ourselves and health. And it's one of the reasons why I love all the information you share and, and why you, how you can lay out some of the science because it starts to help people get a better buy-in for themselves to get outside, get exposed to that sun and, and get all the benefits that are available from it. And for anyone who uh, struggles with that at the beginning, like you mentioned, again, it's so simple, but this really shows how habitual we are as creatures. And if you, you can test this by just putting something in your kitchen in a different place than you normally put it and watch how many times you go back to that original place. You know, when you're, when you're busy and not thinking, you will keep going back there five, maybe 10 times. And it's just a simple spoon or bowl or dish or plate. And then, and that's about as simple as it gets. So then you start to apply it to habits in the midst of stressful, busy life with your responsibilities. And it it helps understand why even something as simple as getting more sunlight if it's not intentional, if you don't start to build that momentum at the beginning, like the first week you said, or sometimes people even need a, a month. But I agree with the sun of all the health habits. It's like, it is the most, for me, like magnetic. It's something I want more of. There's no time in the day when I think to myself, oh, could I you know, hop outside for five minutes, take a little break, enjoy the sunshine. Like there's never a time where I'm like, no, that sounds terrible, right? So it, it does build a momentum of, of its own. Um, contrasted, I love your example, the gym. Like I've never really enjoyed that that much. I really enjoyed playing sports outside, you know, hiking, surfing, doing other things outside. Um, but for me, the gym, gym wasn't that great. And how many people are just dragging themselves in there to do it, which, which is fine. If you know, you want to or not, that's fine. But again, we have these really simple things, the grounding and sunlight that you've mentioned, and we've really focus on and, and wrap their arms around this episode, that's that's there and it's as easy as it gets. Oh, definitely. What you said about the moving the thing in the house um, reminded me of something else that sometimes people who sort of suffer from um, ruminating thoughts, it's it associated with an environment because I've found if I'm going to, um, because we all think things we shouldn't now and again, if I go somewhere else, especially outside, I don't think about the thing. Whereas when I'm back in my house again, I'm like, oh, that person did this and that and the other. So there's a, a big benefit for um, change, change of environment because another thing we didn't talk about here is sort of fields that we're in and we, we're constantly sitting in all kinds of electrical or bio fields, nice ones and nasty ones. So sometimes just going outside creates a whole new environment of um what's you know going on and and it can change uh, people's sort of perception of a particular thing but a lot of people will naturally if they're very angry uh, they'll go for a walk and think and then they come back and feel better so so it's kind of lots of stuff we know already and also you reminded me of something else as well about um sort of feeling good and bliss in the sun because there is sort of a bliss state in the body sort of a, a bit like hypnosis or lucid dreaming or just the ability to just feel pure bliss and it's sort of related to something called phase conjugation or phase conjugated waves. Uh, and the sun actually pumps out um, phase conjugated scalar waves. So they're longitudinal waves. So this also ties in with, with, with the ability to um, find bliss, which again is a whole other topic, but really, really important because lots of people in modern society don't feel bliss. They feel stress or they feel anger. So uh, some people can just say, oh, actually, every time I lay out in the sun, all my problems just go away. So there's another physics reason on top for that as well. Um, and when it comes to sort of human consciousness and the science of that, there is actually sort of evidence um, for this because sort of um, it's not sort of um, mainstream science, but the physicists do know a lot more about consciousness than than we think and probably more than the biologists. And it's just like sometimes people need to be like told and oh yeah I actually feel really blissful and I just go outside in the sun and I don't know why so so now they do 
I love it. I love it. That's perfect. So if anyone's listening, they think they're too busy to take care of their health or want to improve it, but uh, struggle to find the time. If you want a biohacking stack, you can get outside, take in the light, like that, what Dr. Sarah said, do it grounded and start to welcome the feeling of bliss. I, mean, I, I love that one because so many people want to improve their mood, their emotions. You know, that we talk a lot about, you know, letting go of anger or, you know, how you don't want to sit and ruminate in anxiety because it will just build. But, you know, tell that to somebody in a panic attack, it you know, seems like the hardest thing in the world to do. Contrasted that with positive emotions. I mean, bliss, it's about as good as it's going to get. So to, um, I'm, I'm going to do that. That's one takeaway I've got going forward when I spend my time out in the sun to really like, you know, let myself feel the bliss or just these lighter, higher emotions. Cause, um, that's another aspect of, uh, physics and our human experience is what you focus on expands, what you experience and train will increase what you put your attention on will increase. And conversely, if you can let some of that other negativity go, that's how it can start to fall away. Wow. Well, oh, yeah. I'm gonna... I mean, we've got sort of constructive and destructive wave and wave collapse. So um, things like anger and those kind of non-shareable thoughts, they're incoherent. Um, whereas the sort of shareable thoughts um, have a sort of deeper effect, which we won't go into, but you have sort of touched on it. So uh, uh, Again, if something like the sun and going out in it can help you to have this bliss state, exactly as you said, it's sort of like focus and, and concentration. Because actually, in terms of the the, um, the waves, not not just the light, but the plasma that the sun pushes out, that um, helps with phase conjugation and um, implosion and cure human focus. And this is really important for school children because it's really difficult. Uh, blue light in, inside get, is the complete opposite. It doesn't create these beautifully coherent sort of um, cascades and it doesn't promote bliss states and it doesn't promote um, implosion. It does the opposite. But then if we think about society now and how many children have ADHD, uh, it, it kind of all makes sense. And when it comes to physics, I would say physics is a far more powerful scientific modality at the moment. Uh, and sometimes people just have never heard of th these kind of waves because it's inherently more complicated than biology. So looping right back to the beginning of what you were talking about, that people have heard of food and supplements and things because bio biology and biochemistry is much easier to understand, whereas physics is much more complicated. But that's the problem that, that, that people, if they took the time out to look at physics, learn about it, because it is something like maths everyone hates at school and nobody understands. And, and there's a lot more to physics than people think. And I think that's a really important way into sort of learning to be your own scientist um, is to learn about physics. And, and I don't think it's actually that complicated because I'm no good at maths at all. And I learned a lot of physics later. Um, but then, I, then there's the concept of, of physics. Um, and sometimes there are people that need evidence. And when you start to look about, look into human consciousness um, and focus and tie that in with coherent longitudinal waves, it makes complete sense about how classrooms should be outside and why there's all this prob these problems of children inside on blue light, on iPads trying to learn. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with the children is that they haven't got an ADHD disease somebody's put them in an environment that's not um, conducive for how our brain waves, our sort of alpha and gamma waves and everything want, want to function. So it's sort of deeper than that. And also there are adults with ADHD as well. Um, and some people don't want to take Adderall and um, these other medications because like we were saying before, we've taken one aspect of biochemistry in a pill, put it in a person and expected it to work. But our bodies are much cleverer than that. We put a pill in and then some weird reaction starts off in a different part of the body. And then you need another medication to counteract that side effect. And also, um, I think about 70% of medications have some kind of effect on our circadian um, system. So th there's a whole plethora of weird side effects that we don't even know about messing up our body clocks. And some people can be on sort of five or 10 meds and then you need another five or 10 meds to counteract those. And it can all begin yeah, just with, to fall asleep. Yeah, exactly. And and it can all begin in sort of teenage years that people start with, oh, I need some Adderall um, 
because I can't concentrate and now I can't sleep. So I need a sleeping pill. Oh, now I've got depression. So I need an SSRI. Oh, this SSRI is not working. I need, I need two of them. And, and by the time they're 18, they can be on five meds. And, it, and it's very terrifying, I think. Um, and it, it's the same for adults. And with coming off meds, I think this is something really important because you can explain in terms of what we've been talking about, about light, how there's specific colors of light that match up with specific neurotransmitters. Um, and then things like nitric oxide that UVA makes, because that's a major blood pressure lowerer. So, so for every drug that somebody's on, there's always something, uh, if we look in light, there's some kind of light frequency or deficiency of a frequency that could substitute for that medication. Uh, but like anything, it's you know, no matter what, there's always more. We have to look at people holistically because there's all sorts of other things to do with quantum biology that are really important. But I think light is something, an aspect of physics that people can um, sort of understand more readily than some of the other aspects. Um, because yeah, we, yeah. So it's a really good place to start. But also it's really important for people to understand that physics and quantum mechanics controls biology. So you'll never understand biology if you don't understand physics. And you don't need to be a mathematician to understand uh, physics either. It's just some, one of those badly taught subjects that people are frightened of. <laughs> yeah. So going back to learning, let's say we put you in charge as a city planner. What's your ideal classroom look like for these kids to offset these ADHD effects? Would it be something outside with like a roof, but not enclosed or what would it look like? I, th I think it would be back to, because when I went to school, um, what happened was that you had to walk, even if you went on a bus stop, you still had to sort of walk somewhere. And then, so we were hanging around outside waiting for buses or some people walked to school or some people cycled, which was perfect, was okay. Um, and then. Um, when we got to school, we could never allowed in straight away. We had to hang around outside for ages. That then we came in, and that then we did some work. And then when it came to the first break, we all got chucked out for half an hour, and then we were allowed back in. And then this the same for lunch hour that you could eat your food, you could buy food inside, and then you got chucked out again. And the same thing happened in the afternoon break. And we had a nice big field and all sorts of things to roll around in um, outside and we were forced outside. Talking to school teachers nowadays, especially in the US, sometimes the children get dropped, they, they get into a car, they get driven to school, they get out of the car, they go into the school and then they don't come out of the school until it's the end of the day. So, so it's like just going back to basics again because with the ADHD epidemic, when I was at school, um, it didn't exist. Um, I'm sure that there's real ADHD, you know, that's something totally different. But but I don't remember anybody at school um, having ADHD. There wasn't any diagnosis. And yes, there were disruptive children, but they were sort of minimal. And that could be for other reasons. And like I said, there is real ADHD. So yes, that would be the very first thing is to go back to before all these problems came and look at the structure of how did a child get to school and what did they do when they were at school? I also know they've cut down the amount of sort of, they might be called something different in the US of um, um, sort of games, we'd call it, as in going outside and doing sport, like playing hockey or soccer or rugby or whatever, that there used to be a given number of hours per week and now it's been sort of massively cut down. Um, so back to your question. First of all, the other problem was when I went to school, LED lights didn't exist. So that would be the first thing is to change the lights in a school back to incandescence. That then the next thing would be about making sure with the iPads um, that when they're not being used, they're all switched off and they're put away because being around 20 iPads isn't healthy for kids or the teacher. Um, it's like being on an airplane where you're just um, surrounded by everybody else's sort of radiation. So, so it would be about understanding that learning just through um, computers isn't the best idea and to go back to paper, maybe. And like you said, taking the roof off the school, that would be the next level. Um, uh, but then you have to factor in rain. So I, uh, so I think depending on the country or the location, when you plan lessons, there's lots of things that could be done outside instead of inside. Because with children and learning, it's not just, you know, the whole linear learning and left brain and no kinesthetic or um, like 
or auditory learners. It's a schooling's very geared to a particular type of learner of just sitting and learning things and writing them down. Whereas um, there's lots of stuff, especially to do with science in school or drama or whatever, where it could all be done outside. So, so that, that's how I would restructure it because it's not going to be practical to keep the, have the children outside all the time. But then um, uh, factoring into the, into the curriculum things which require you to go outside to do it. Because I'm not sure whether you did this in school. We used to do this thing where we used to put potassium permanganate on the school field because it irritated the worms. And then we'd spend about four hours measuring how big the, um, the, the area of the school was. Then we'd wait for the worms that got all itchy to come up and we'd count the worms in different areas. And then we had to work out how many worms um, there would be in the whole school field then this field next door. And we used to love stuff like that. So I think about sort of constructing scientific education that reconnects people back with doing things with nature or even just teaching children how to identify plants and things in the, in, in the vicinity. Because sometimes people, when I've gone to the US, I've said, oh, what's that? What's that? What's that bird? What's that insect? And people are like, well, I've got no idea. So th that, that kind of... Um, uh, approach, which would be difficult, but then back to very simple things. If none of that was possible, it would just be about changing the light bulbs um, and then making the children stay outside when they have break. I think you might call it recess. The, so yeah. there's so many different sort of, but it's one of these things, um, unless you understand all of the biology of light, this sounds complete insa insane nonsense um, to people. So that, so it's, fundamentally a, a lack of education but then sometimes it's obvious there's something massively wrong and people just put it's like the ostrich putting his head in the sand or let's just pretend there's nothing wrong with our children um so it's about um educating people about light um and then um giving them sort of analogies to times back back in the past when these problems didn't exist and you can easily look back to what people did at school then so, so it is a very, it is something that massively bothers me. Uh, but luckily, uh, the, when you start talking about physics to people, it's very hard to argue with it. And then there's sort of 40 years worth now of circadian biology research with more and more coming out. So it's just about getting the information through. But then it, sometimes I feel like I'm fighting a losing battle because we haven't even talked about processed food. <laughs> so people can't even seem to stop children eating that for every meal. So when it comes to this concept of light, it's like, will it, will people accept it? Who knows? Yeah. Well, going back to one of the things I liked you said about just your example of schooling and children getting them outside, being active in their learning. Mm. And this applies to adults too. And so if you're listening to this episode, the real learning happens when you implement. The information mm. is nice and, and it can open your mind and it can motivate you a little bit but it will never happen until you actually implement it and experience it. And, you know, of any episode we've done, of any health topic we've done, again, open the door, step outside. It's about as easy as it gets. And when people experience that enough with a little consistency, they'll experience what you already described, like the lifting mood and whatever other joy and improvements come from that, calming. And that's when people really get it and they really won't get it before that till they experience it in their body. But I think you've really given a lot of, uh, again, information to motivate and practical ways to implement. So I think certainly you'll have uh, made a mark in the world to anyone that listens to this episode yeah. and move people along a little bit. Because you're right, there is so much to cover. Um, I'm glad we kind of wrapped the arms around light because it gives people something tangible than if we had covered all of the different areas, which I would love to too, and had to bite my tongue a couple of times. Um, <laughs> but this is a nice, really nice entry point for anyone. If people want to follow more of your work or work with you, how can they do that? Okay. So I go by um, Busy Superhuman on social media. So I've got a sub stack for people that like to read. I've got YouTube. So that's long form. And there's videos, educational ones and podcasts with quite a lot of sort of well-known people in the field. And then I've got Instagram for sort of pictures um, with sort of a short amount of, of writing, unlike Substack, and then reels and things. Um, I do have a members group that people can join. That's like a monthly group. And then I have a variety of courses. And I do do one-to-one -one sometimes, but 
um, of late. Uh, I, I just think there are so many basics that people could just glean out of my free, P I've got some free PDFs as well on quantum basics, or if they just read through what I've got already, it would give them quite a good start. So um, I'm more of a, more for the courses and more for people learning as a group. Um, but if somebody was very like keen to speak to me, um, I, I'd also do one-to-ones, but um, I, there's plenty of free things to start with. I, I prefer if people had an understanding of what I am all about before booking a one-to-one -one so that they know they're not going to leave with like another big bag of supplements or whatever. It's a different approach. Um, so that's, that's it. So it'd be busy superhuman or just Dr. Sarah Pugh. Um, you'll find me either way. Okay, great. Yeah, we will link to all that in the show notes. So if you're listening, you can just scroll down and click on whichever one suits you. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been great. Thanks.